This is Charlene Katra. I'm the Executive Director of the National Catholic Partnership on Disability. And we are extremely pleased to have with us a very special guest tonight to continue our conversation on suicide during this fall series. It's Father Ron Rollheiser is with us this evening. Uh, Father, welcome to our uh, webinar on suicide. Thanks for being with us. Well, thank you for having me, Shirley. Thank you. The sound is good. You can hear me. I can. Okay. And I think if we have any difficulties, Bob should interject and let us know, but I can hear you okay. very well. Okay. Thanks, Shirley. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. And, and Father, if you would, before we go any further, could you at least open with a brief prayer for us? I would be most appreciative. Okay. Okay. In the name of the Father, Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, we ask your blessing. We ask your blessing to um, lift pain all over our world, the pain of people are experiencing, from, especially from deaths in their family. We ask you to especially lift the pain of those who have experienced uh, a loved one lost by suicide. We pray that your son and his infinite mercy, his infinite compassion and understanding will lead us to a deeper understanding of suicide. We make this prayer through Jesus, who is Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, Father Ron Rollheiser is the, uh, and I, I know as of, I think it was 2005, you were named president of the Oblate School of Theology in San Antonio. Yes. But I have recently been informed that you have, you are now emeritus. Yeah, I uh, stepped down just three weeks ago. Very recent. Well, congratulations yes. on that. We're, we're glad for all the work you've always done, but, and, um, and obviously continuing to do so. Thank you for that. The topic tonight, I don't want to waste any time really with my voice. I know people are here to listen to you as I am as well. So I want to go ahead and just start asking you some questions and letting you um, take us on a journey this evening. And I know to enlighten us and to help us better understand and be in a better place, especially in regards to such a serious topic as suicide. Uh, would you start, please, by talking to us a little bit about your own personal experience with suicide, um, how deaths possibly of what people you personally loved yourselves have, and how it's impacted you? Thanks, Shirley. That's a good question because that my, my, uh, the work I've done in suicide, suicide has been prompted not just by pastoral concern, but also, you know, my own life. Um, now, it's interesting, in our immediate family, we've only lost a, a grand nephew to suicide a few years ago. But suicide touched me most deeply when I was 14 years old, a high school student. I remember this, that summer, all I wanted to do was to make our high school baseball team. And we had a neighbor. Uh, I grew up on a farm. And we had a neighbor, wonderful young man. He was 22 years old. But he had the body of an athlete, the body that I loved to have had. It was just gentle, wonderful, athletic, you know, handsome movie star man. And uh, on May the 3rd of that year, he hung himself in your barn. I was 14, and, and nothing in my whole life has ever scarred me psychically like that. You know, when I was young. There's no way of processing this. Of course, as a young guy, you don't talk to anybody. Um, but it just, it, 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 it scarred me, but it scarred me in a good way. I, I'm a priest today because of that, that incident. I mean, it's just... Uh, um, it quickly did things to me beyond my years. And um, and then, you know, through the years, we had another neighbor commit suicide. But once I became a priest, um, from my very first year on, I was dealing with suicide. And what I do with the funerals, I thought, I need to address this. I'm just going to not just say to people, well, we're dead and he's dead and we trust the mercy of God. I think the issue has to be addressed. And so about 20 years ago, I started writing on it. Uh, and I don't do a lot of writing. I do a piece maybe every year or so, but after 20 years, a lot of pieces. But I can tell you now that not a single week goes past where I don't get a letter, an email, or a phone call from a family who's lost someone to suicide. And say, there isn't anything out there in terms of consolation or understanding. So it's been a big piece in my life, Sharon. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I'm, I'm grateful, too, because as you're being heard by others who have probably had similar or some experience personally, I think it hopefully encourages them and gives them strength and support to 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 talk about it because that's that's the, what's so important is just this dialogue. 
Yes. Especially to help remove stigma, correct? Yes, very much so. Okay. Um, I think a common question people ask is why? Why does someone commit suicide, die by, choose to die by suicide? Is there a way you can respond to that for us? Yes. yes. In fact, that, Shirley, that, that, that's, that's a kind of a central question. I think that one and also, you know, what happens with God and so on. But the why question, you know, and, you know, and, and the stigma around it. Let, let me lead in there. This is a big piece. First of all, you know, in, in my writings, in my thought of this, I make a distinction between two things. Somebody who dies by suicide and somebody who kills themselves, you know, in, in this sense, that let's look at the killing ourselves. A person like Hitler who killed himself, you know. See, and everybody I've known who's died by suicide, they didn't do that. They, they simply, they literally collapsed. See, somebody who kills themselves is somebody who's too proud to live. Somebody like Hitler can say, I'm just too proud to live with the rest of the people. That, that's killing yourself. Um, every person I know as through suicide was a bruised, deep, sensitive, wounded person. So that suicide, if I can put it into an image, is more of a collapse. Killing yourself is an act of arrogance. You know, see, so suicide victims die out of weakness. The same as, as uh, when, if you die of cancer or heart attack or whatever, you die out of weakness, you know, which is the opposite of killing yourself. And, um, and you're going to see that now why? You know, why do people, again, this is the vast majority of suicides. I want to give you two images. One of them is, somebody gave that to me years ago, one of their children, they said, this, this kid was in pain. And they said, it's equivalent to, imagine you're in a high-rise building and your clothing is on fire. So you jump out of the window for certain death, but you're burning. In fact, that happened at 9-11. Right. It, people, you know, they, they were on fire, so they jumped out of a window. But you can be on fire internally, mm. but the pain is so strong, you know. Um, that's one way, uh, image. The other image is, I, I think the best image we have to is, is compared to physical death. Like, for instance, two very common mean, uh, ways of death, you know, or three, you see. Cancer, stroke, heart attack, death by diabetes, you know. Um, you know, suicide is the equivalent to emotional cancer, an emotional stroke, emotional diabetes, emotional uh, yes. uh, Alzheimer's, and so on. Which, which takes you, you know, we don't choose to die by cancer. Most suicide victims, they don't choose to die. So that their death, in a certain sense, they are, they are taken out of life by a disease, the same as, you know, if you die by cancer, heart attack, stroke. Um, and that's also a lot on, that's why oftentimes, you know, it's so frustrating, we're helpless, you know, uh, you know, you can stand by a loved one who's dying of cancer and there's not much you can do about it, you know? Sometimes in a family, you know, somebody has mental issues and so on, emotional issues, and there's not much you can do about it. You know, you try. And then also see suicides, there's, there's two kinds, you know? Some of them, there's a long history of clinical depression. And by the time that I say, you know, it's, it's, it's like a terminal disease. Other times it can be just out of the blue. Well, the same as, Heart attacks and strokes can happen in a minute. You, know, you can have an emotional stroke, an emotional heart attack, or you can die of emotional cancer. But honestly, Shardy, in all the cases I've had, people I've ever been involved with, I've sued that in every case, it was a sensitive person. I, I, where I took the title of the book, a person at a certain point became too bruised to touch. You know, and, uh, and so they, they succumb to it rather than do it, you know. Thank you. And, and I love the title of your book, too, that bruised and wounded, just as you're giving us better analogies into that title. Um, and you mentioned that, and I was going to comment, too, or ask, that there's often comorbidities, too, going on in, in situations. Uh, I, you know, like if someone is depressed, you might look for an addiction or vice versa. I mean, sometimes there's more than one thing that might be happening to a person in their life, their circumstances. So many yes. things affect us. Yeah, yeah, and 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 then some things can make you snap, or some things can simply wear you down. You know, mm -hmm. um, see, mental illness. Another thing that's bringing up. You know, we we don't understand mental illness. We still don't. You know, um, 
you know, we, our society, we, 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 we're beginning to understand more and more how physical illness works, but mental illness is still the great mystery out there that, uh, you know, and what happens like, you know, because, uh, especially if, if you yourself aren't struggling, you know, for instance, if you have a nice, robust, healthy sanity, it's pretty hard to understand why somebody hasn't got that. You say, well, isn't it normal? Well, it is normal, but, you know, the same as not everybody's physically healthy, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, and I've, in my experience, just, that, you know, as being a professor and being a priest and so on through the years, for instance, at a university campus, I've met some brilliant people, you know, um, with PhDs who are writing books, who have a very fragile mental sanity, you know? You know, um, you know I grew up on a farm where, you know, a family were robust kids and so on. And I, I didn't, until I got older, to realize what an incredible gift that is, you know? And you just take for granted that everybody's so mentally robust. The mm -hmm. same as you can't take for granted that everybody's physically robust. Some people are just not dealt the right genes. Exactly. Uh, and, so we have but, different frames of reference. Like I say, we have different family upbringings, history. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and the same as we have different physical genes, we also have different emotional psychic genes. Absolutely. You know? now, is that some reason why then, despite all these advancements in understanding mental health, society and church is no different, we still struggle with understanding suicide? Very yeah. much so. Very much so. You know, it's interesting. And, and, and that's a bit of a puzzlement to me, you know, that... Uh, See, when I grew up, I was a kid in the 50s into the 60s, you know. At that time, there was just this, this radical taboo, both in the church and society, around suicide. You simply didn't talk about it. And, you know, as, as, a, as a Catholic, you didn't necessarily even get a, a, a funeral inside of a cemetery. And I remember when, when I was 14 and our neighbor, our, our priest did the radical thing of having a suicide, I mean, a suicide person buried in, in recreant mass and so on. He was that was pretty edgy at the time, you know. But it's interesting, like you said, for all our advances, there's still a taboo. You notice you never read in the paper somebody committed suicide. You'll say died suddenly, died tragically, you know. See, even, even in the secular world, we still can't wrap our hands and our, our minds around it. We still can't say the words, you know. And so, so that taboo is still very much present. I don't know if you've ever read an obituary in the paper. I've never, you know. No, that's not common. It's no. definitely not common. I mean, do you think some of that is protecting the people that are grieving as well? Possibly. Is it? I mean, because I'll ask you that. How? How is it? What's a healthy way? Let's say if there is a healthy way, and I, if anyone could maybe speak to that, it may be you, for someone to grieve the loss of a loved one who dies by suicide. Okay. If you have a couple of questions in there. Let me do the grieving thing and then, 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 okay. then back back in terms of the, the understanding. Thanks. The grieving thing is important. Now, I was saying with, with grieving, first of all, no matter who you are and no matter how much you, you know, you're open, it's still going to be a, a blow like you've never felt before. Sure. And so, first of all, expect, first of all, to be really shocked, but also to be really angry. You know, I think sometimes people, it, it, it's hard to process no. Your loved one kills themselves, and then at the same time, you want to kill them. It's, it's, I mean, you, you have to process this anger. Sure. Why did you do this to me, and so on? And and so that that, that first of all, it, it almost kind of blocks your grieving. Like, how do you grieve when you're just so angry with this happened, You know, but to understand that anger is a hard form of grief. You know what tears are? They're just soft anger. Mm -hmm. See, so anger, it's so, start, so let yourself be angry, let yourself rage at the person, also let yourself rage at God. God mm -hmm. doesn't mind you having a, you know, a, a, a good, you know, wrestling match with, you know, Jacob and the angel and so on, but give yourself that permission. Uh, and, and I want to have three rules. One of them, give yourself permission to be angry. Secondly, know that it's going to take time. It's going to take time. There's no magic bullet. I'll give you an example. I was a woman friend of mine on the West Coast, her husband one day, just out of the blue, committed suicide. You know, two young daughters. Um, but it hit her so I, you know, she was she was in a dark place for years. I don't say it's gonna get better, it's, just, it's not gonna get better. And she was just it took some years 
today she's happily married and she's happily preserving her life. But that took 10 years, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it takes time, it washes clean. A suicide death will wash clean, no matter what the circumstance, but it's not gonna do it in months. Uh, you know, so give yourself permission to, to rage, to be angry, uh, take the time and also be prepared to, 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 to grieve at that level. See, it's probably going to be the hardest pain you work through in your life. You know, so don't, 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 uh, uh, there's going to be no easy way out of this thing. You, know? you really have to take care of yourself and be patient yeah. with yourself. Yeah. 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 Right? And, and, and you won't find any, I remember working with this one, but I won't say, you're not going to find any tonics. You know, a tonic is kind of an escape that you, you go on a vacation, go on a trip, do a cruise. <laughs> And you might want to do that for other reasons, but it's not, that's not going to solve the issue. Mm -hmm. The loved one's dead, you know. Uh, uh, time will do it, and uh, just open this. That death will wash clean, but it's going to take time. Thank you for repeating that, and, and I want to mention to our listeners that there is a chat opportunity. So if people have comments or questions, they, they are free to use that chat opportunity on, the, on our website. Um, and I do see that someone just asked this, Father. Uh, well, they did mention they had once seen an obituary. It sounded like where the family wanted to raise awareness. So they did comment yeah, yeah, that yeah, the death yeah. was by suicide, which would, would make sense on the other side of what I mentioned. Um, but they also said, what do you mean by wash clean? Okay, I want to give you an image, a biblical image, and I want to try to interpret psychologically. You know, in the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus dies on the cross, and he's on the cross, and he's just forgiven the good thief and so on. Mm -hmm. But the way Luke writes up the Passion of Christ, when Jesus died, his death washes everything clean. He mm -hmm. can feel good. <laughs> There's no, it, 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 everything's going to be okay. It's truly in our Lord said, all will be well, and all will be well. You know? So first of all, Christ's death washes stuff clean. So, so you know, you, you can be... Uh, you take the word clean. You can be sorrowing and you know feeling a lot of pain, but there's two kinds of pain. There's pain that's unclean and pain that's clean. You know, see when you're first processing suicide, the pain's unclean. You know, this is a stigma. Where you know I should have been there. What did I do wrong, and so on. Um, but at a certain point, it becomes clean. Um, and in fact, that's true of all, of all deaths. My parents died and died pretty close together when I was 21 years old. And for about two years, this, this was a heartache, a darkness, a place I didn't want to go. But after a few years, my parents, it's a warm memory, it's wonderful. Uh, I feel their presence, you know, I have no, uh, I've been missed them, but there's no sorrow about their deaths. But the same thing will happen with somebody who died of suicide. Initially, the anger, how can they do this, and there's a stigma, and so on. After a while, you'll have an understanding. This was Jack, and these were his problems. He was a good-hearted man, and you know, there's nobody to blame, and you know, God is merciful, and, and, and it, it feels clean, you know, Thank as you. opposed to like, how can they do that? How do we explain it? You know, we put a little asterisk, or you know, you know, what often happens is we take their pictures now. Mm. You know, when somebody has a suicide. You take the picture down, you don't talk about them. Uh, there's almost like a little asterisk around their name. And that's tragic. Yeah, and maybe that, re re I think you're speaking now to something in your book where you talked about redeeming their memory. Is this what you're referring to right now yeah, in that yes, sense yeah. of um, how we how we respond sometimes mm -hmm. to our, or about our loved ones post-suicide? Can yeah. you speak a little bit, a bit about that? Maybe someone hasn't read the book yet. We hope they get bruised and wounded and do read the book. But yeah. speak to the, the term, redeem the memory. Okay, okay, well, first of all, it's a stolen term. I got this from uh, a woman, Nancy Rappaport. Is actually a psychiatrist. I think she's at Harvard. Okay. But she wrote a book, Her Mother Died by Suicide. And so she wrote a book called In My Mother's Wake. In My Mother's Wake. It's a wonderful book. Um, and she talks about how, see, her mother, my mother was a wonderful woman. She went into the oppressive phase in her life and ended up killing herself. And she said, but she was a wonderful woman, and now her whole death and life is seen through that prison. As if, you know, that defines your life. She says, I want to redeem my mother's memory. I want to put out that she was a wonderful woman. 
sure. you know, and she died of cancer or whatever. And so I'll give you an example here. I live in San Antonio. And uh, we, in here, we had a wonderful theologian called Virgil Alizani. Yes, he's the first major Hispanic theologian in the United States. He's got yes. honorary doctorates from all over, caught at Notre Dame and so on. And he ended up committing suicide. Mm -hmm. Now, I went to his funeral. And, and you know, we, were, we did our best, but there was this hush. And there was kind of darkness about it. And I thought, had this man died of cancer or of a stroke, there had been this huge celebration of the, the wonderful things he did. See, so I thought, his memory has to be redeemed. Otherwise, you know, the manner of his death becomes a prism to which his whole life is attributed. That's what Nephi Rafa, of course, is about her mother. said, I have this wonderful mother. Mm -hmm. a depressive phase in her life, you know, I don't define her by that. You're going to define her by her, her good qualities, the wonder, kind of the, the spirit she brought into the world and incarnated, you know. Um, so don't take down the pictures. Don't stop telling the stories about them. Begin to tell the stories of their sensitivity, of their goodness, and so on. Right, because the only ones left to redeem them are the living. Right, right. So that's very important. Because yeah. other, otherwise, and you know that, their death, that the manner of their death is going to become a prism through which they're seen. So it's almost like when, when they put an asterisk beside somebody's name, you know, like, you know, there's something went wrong. It's limiting, it's life. limiting, yeah. yes. It's not normal, you know, uh, you've got to take the asterisk away. Nice, nice. Um, theological perspectives as Christians, you know, we need to draw on our, our understanding of suicide, but the questions now are, what's God's reaction? Okay, I think for us, for many of us, maybe that's the most important question of all. Like, how does God react to suicide? How do we understand that theologically, pastorally, and so on? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I want to do, say three things. The first one is, we always have to remember that God is mercy, God is love, and God is understanding, and God understands us better than we understand ourselves. God is more sympathetic than we are sympathetic to ourselves. I'll give you an example. I once did a funeral for a young man who died pretty tragically, not suicide. He was a young guy, a Catholic kid, but he was, at the time he wasn't going to church, he was on drugs, he was living with his girlfriend, you know, and, 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 and got killed in a, in a drunk in an accident, you know. But we knew this kid, he was a good kid. And I remember at the funeral, his aunt said to me, he said, he had a good heart. He said, if I were running the gates of heaven, I'd let him in. I thought, well, don't you think God, if we understood this kid, don't you think God understands him better than we do? And God reads the heart and so on. So God is all merciful. Uh, secondly, remember I said, these are bruised people. They're wounded people. They're gentle people. Scripture tells us and Jesus tells us that God particularly loves the weak, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, he says, not the strong need the doctor, it's the sick, you know. But finally, more and most importantly of all, I want to give you a Catholic doctrine, Christian doctrine, Catholic, that it's, it's, it's a forgotten doctrine, it's in our creed, and it's the most consoling doctrine in the whole world. And it's never more consoling than with a funeral. And that's, you know, when we say in the creed, he descended into hell. What does that mean that Jesus descended into hell? Well, it means a lot of things, but let me tell you one of the things it means. And I want to tell you three stories. Okay. And then I want you to collapse them into one story. And that's my that list. They say in Jeopardy would be my final answer. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and I'll begin with a suicide story. When I was still living in Edmonton, some friends of mine, they had a 20-year-old daughter who had a long history of clinical depression, you know. She went away to college and attempted suicide. It wasn't successful. They brought her home. And then for the next three months, they took her to doctor. They took her to psychiatrists. They took her every place. They tried to love her. They tried to be with her all the time. And it didn't succeed. She ended up killing herself. See, she had descended into a place inside of her that no medicine, no psychiatry, no love could ever touch anymore. Okay, close that frame. There's a very famous holy painting, a painting by a, a person called Holman Hunt. And you've probably all seen knockoffs of this. And it's the, the, the one called the Jesus Who Knocks. And if you ever go to St. Paul's Cathedral in London, the original's there. Beautiful painting, but, but this is the image. So 
there's a man huddled in kind of darkness behind a thick oak door. The door is, you know, really this thick, you know. And uh, Jesus is outside the door with a lantern, and Jesus is knocking on the door to come in, but there's only a doorknob on the inside. See, so you can see that Jesus is knocking with the light. You're in the darkness, but you have to open the door. Close that. Now, go to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 20, and the first resurrection appearance of Jesus to the disciples after when he rises from the dead. He's appeared first to Mary Magdalene individually, but to the church, his first major appearance. And he works this way. He said, all the disciples were in a room with the door locked, and they were huddled in fear. It's quite an image. See, they're, they're huddling in fear. Mm -hmm. They said, the door is locked. They said, and Jesus came right through the locked door, stood in the middle, breathed out, which is, you know, he wrote the very first page of the Bible. The beginning was the formless void, and God breathed over the body. And light began to separate from darkness. So Jesus breathes and says, peace, peace. Say it again, peace. See, the idea is he comes through the locked door into the center of their fear. Now, back to the first thing. You can be sure that this sensitive young woman, when she woke up on the other side, Jesus was standing in the middle of her fear and saying, Peace be with you. See, when, when the doctor says he descended to hell, he's, there, one of the, there's many meanings to that doctrine, but one of them is there isn't a hell we can create that God can't come in and bring mm -hmm. out peace. See, and, and it's the most consoling doctrine in all of religion, not just Christianity. It's just, I know more religious, there's nothing with Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Islam, or Judaism that's that strong, you know. Christian. So it's only like this. When we can't help each other, God can still help us. When we can't help ourselves, God can still help us. But see, there's no darkness, there's no space, there's no chaos, you know, there's no mental illness, there's nothing that we can create. Sometimes we can't get through it anymore. But God can get through it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and um, you know, so you can be sure. Uh, or pretty sure, and, and virtually, I mean, when, when a sense that a good person dies, you know, they've reached a, 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 some kind of internal chaos and darkness that medicine, love, psychiatry can't penetrate anymore, but God can, you know. They're, they're lost in a certain sense to this world, they're not lost to God, you know. And, um, and I said, that's, that's, that's a doctrine. That's a dogma in the church. It's not creed. Not something I'm making up. And I wish we could preach that more, period, you know, because it just speaks to the great mercy and understanding of God. And also, not just for suicide, but, you know, you know, there's so much breakup and heartache in our world and people who die angry and re unreconciled and where we can't touch each other anymore. Sometimes we just can't get through, you know, or sometimes we can't help ourselves anymore. Oh, I'm going to ask this question because I know when I grew up, you know, back in the day as well, you know, the teaching, well, I'll just ask the question now. Where does the church put uh, death by suicide? Is it a grave sin? Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, okay. I'll start here. Okay. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, is like a little, little note here just so I don't forget any parts of it. Okay. The Catholic, Catholic Church has, has four items, four articles on it. And basically, and it makes five points. Each of the five points is good. So the first point it says is God is the master of life. See, we're not master of our own life. We don't own our life. So it, our life, crassly put, it, our life isn't something we may take. You know, see, you, 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 we don't own our lives. You can't say it's my life and do whatever I want. No, no, that's not the Christian teaching. God is the master of our lives. We're not master of our own lives. So secondly, then they say, then if you do suicide, it's something contrary to the way God made us. It's something contrary to, 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 uh, to, to the faith. It's something contrary to nature. Okay? Then thirdly, it says, now if you do this voluntarily, with full conscience, you know what you're doing, and particularly if, you want, if you're doing it to try to, you know, scandalize people or something then it's a great fault, you know? But then, the very next paragraph, it says, however, oftentimes in suicides, there's very mitigating circumstances. 
emotional illness, you know, psychological stress, other things that 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 can take your freedom away. And then the fifth thing it says, uh, we always trust. They said in the mystery of God, and the mercy of God. That you know, again, God's mercy is beyond us. God, God's mystery is beyond us. You know, uh, and again, like in everything else, I just want to say, Shani, in everything, we always have to bring it back to the theology of God. If we believe in the God of Jesus incarnated and taught, we have very little to worry about. You know. This, this, you know, that example I gave this woman said, you know, like, I understood this kid. I would let him into heaven. Oh, God. God understands your kids better than you understand. God is more solicitous for them. God is more solicitous of our lives than we are, you know. And I like the characters that we have to put this back to the mystery, the mercy of God, you know. So, and then again, and I think I know the answer then, that so... So where do we believe then that they are in the, for internal life? You're asking me? <laughs> asking you? The vast, vast majority of them are in heaven. You know, why wouldn't they be? They're God's little ones. They're sensitive, you know, souls. I want to see something kind of, uh, I hope I don't get in trouble just for saying this, it's strong, but then I went to a funeral some years ago at home. I wasn't presiding his funeral. But this young man who had killed himself. 34 years old, very sensitive man, and so on. And the priest who did the funeral, um, I really wasn't very pleased with him. Like he, he talked about this is the unforgivable sin, and the person can't do this. And he said, this is what happens when people don't have real values, and so on. And my brother, who was this guy's neighbor, was driving home, and he was just terrific. At one point, he said, there were a lot of people he wished would kill themselves, but they never knew. He said, he's the last person. He said, he's the most sensitive, gentle person I've ever met. You know, mm -hmm. you know see, those are God's little ones. You know, how can you fear for your salvation? You know, what kind of God? Okay, I know if you're a mother of kids and so on, um, or what kind of mother uh, would look at a sensitive kid and say, I know you have a good heart, but you did this wrong. Right, not likely. Um, is there a prayer that can be said for um, a beloved one who's gone? A daily prayer, maybe, or a novena? Anything that you would suggest? Yeah, help? you know, you know, I, I I had a whole. I just gave my last one away last week. Okay. You know, there there are people who write prayers. Uh, you know, if you, um, I don't even really know what websites to go on. Uh, I don't have one right here, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure if you go to a certain, you know, Catholic or Christian websites on suicides, you'll find some prayers. And uh, exactly. or even, you know, uh, you know the poet David White? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. In his last book, he has a beautiful three-page prayer, you know, pray for somebody who died by suicide. Okay, yeah. David White? Yeah. People can look if up. You're familiar, he's, a, he's a very famous poet today, you know, and, uh, so that they're all over. I just don't have one in front of me right now. No worries. I just wondered if you knew it off the top of your head. Sure. Um, another question I think people have is, do our beloved who are gone um, see our sorrow, see our tears? Yes. You know, and, and again, I, I'm, I'm on safe ground here. That's Catholic and Christian dogma. You know, we believe in, again, in the creed. Mm -hmm. The creed, we believe in the communion of saints. And see, the, the Christian doctrine, which is, you know, Catholic and Christian, of the, the, um, we believe that that we're, we're in a communion of life with Jesus and with, mystically, with every baptized person who's alive, but also with everybody who died. So that, and, and, and also that that's been a long, I mean, in, in, uh, even before Christianity, the idea that the, the dead are still with us, that they can see us and so on. You know, uh, it's interesting, just you watch a, a, a football or a baseball game and someone will make a great play and then they point their finger up because their father and mother's in heaven, you know. Um, see, so that, and that isn't wishful thinking. You know, sometimes people, it's almost like it's consoling for us. So we say, it. no, that's, that's dogma. That's hard dogma. Now, 
Now, I want to share something anecdotally, like anecdotal stuff you don't know how true it is, but you know that um, today we have a huge growing lived body of literature about people who have been clinically dead, mm. and then, you know, they were, they were resuscitated, we're dead. And, and some people have been dead for like an hour or, you know, but it's interesting, it's very consoling, in all of those cases, every one of them, you know, they didn't want to come back. Hard you know, read that. You know, no, but that's interesting. They said, with one exception, some of the people who who you know attempted suicide were clinically dead and brought back. They wanted to come back, not because they weren't in heaven. They wanted to come back and, and undo that because of the pain it left for the people behind. Mm. You know, see, so that um, now again, that's anecdotal. You know, it's not that's not dogma. But the dogma is we live in the kingdom of saints. So. You know, in, in fact, <laughs> it's scary. You know, when my mom, dad, my mom and dad were alive, when they weren't around, they didn't see me. Now they see me all the time. You know, that's what I say too. They're always with us. Yeah, more so. So they do see our sorrow. You know, just got a little flurry of traffic here in the chat box. I don't know if you can see it, Father. I'm gonna try and see if I can yeah, see yeah. what's here. Um, how do you walk the fine line between a compassionate pastoral response to people who are suffering the effects of suicide without normalizing suicide to the extent that it becomes a valid logical option for others? Yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. And that's a delicate, that's a very, very delicate question. You know, in terms of, uh, you know I, and I, I've thought about that a lot because, you know, for instance, as a priest, and as, as a, you, you try to offer consolation people uh, and yet at the same time see that uh, you don't want this to become well you can do this you know it's not that big a deal normalize, right yeah yeah so you, you you can't normalize it so we need to and maybe that's why we can never fully get rid of the taboo around it you know the stigma and so on see that stigma comes from the fact that um, you're going against the deepest instinct in all of life and that is to preserve life, you know. See, so, um, you know, that's a hard one. You know, it, it, it's a, in terms of, because you don't want to hurt people who are already deeply hurting from losing a loved one by not offering full pastoral stuff. And yet at the same time, you don't want to run the danger of, you know, making suicide um, an option. And this is particularly true for young people, you know, with, High school kids and so on. A lot of times, you know, you, you can get a copycat type of deal going, you know. Um, and yet at the same time, you don't want to abnormally scare people or, you know, so you're going to go to hell and so on. Uh, you know, uh, you know that, 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 that's when I struggle with. That, that is a tough question. You know, it's kind of, okay, so we have to keep reflecting and praying on that. You know, thin line between, you know, you got to offer consolation, but you still have to keep the stigma, the taboo, that this is not an exit route from the planet, you know, right. especially with young people, because, you know, I didn't know it, but, but apparently with teenagers and high school kids, this can be. Well, I know a few years ago when I first heard the term cyberside, or I think it's cyberside, correct, where people were actually, kids who were being bullied online, cyber, yeah. cyberspace, yeah. were ended up, you know, choosing to kill themselves by suicide over that torment torment being tormented um it, clearly and even just in the year where this unprecedented year we're living in with so many more losses and so many more um challenges that you know we're seeing i think uh influx of of other you know either you know the grief is increased in more people they've lost more jobs loved ones etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and you mentioned earlier to me even that you've, I think, done about six presentations probably already in probably this year on suicide in particular. So just that, unfortunately, the need is rising to talk about it more and learn more. What are ways that, you know, that you would even suggest for listeners on helping this to, to kind of lower that stigma and the stereotypes? Are there things that individually some of us can do that can help, especially in parish communities? Well, I think to, to, to uh, first of all, I mean, I'll, I'll start from, from, from the highest, you know, 
to to offer to try to you know keep you up. But maybe to understand you. with suicide, there's also a big difference between whether you're talking to somebody who's lost somebody and you're trying to console them, or whether you're you're giving a presentation on prevention of suicide. You know, I would use a different language, a different approach. You know, see if tonight you're say like, give me a talk or let's talk about how to prevent suicide. That's a different ballpark. You know, you know, if you're saying like, how do we try to understand suicide, console people who have lost loved ones? That's that's uh, uh, see. So if I were talking to people who were, you know, and I'm taking for granted it's part of our audience tonight, who are trying to understand suicide, and it's a pain about lost loved ones, then I would talk about the stuff we're talking about tonight, you know. Uh, see, if, if you're talking group about suicide prevention, uh, that's a whole other area, which I have no specialization, you know. But you know, there's a lot of people that specialize in how to look for signs, what you're supposed to see, what you're supposed to do, uh, you know. Uh, that, that's another whole thing about suicide. But now about the stigma. Again, I, I would be much stronger about removing the stigma if somebody has lost a loved one to suicide than if I talk to the high school kids just on ultimate suicide. You know? mm -hmm. uh, see, so, so it, it, it's partly tailored to the audience, but, but to an audience like ours tonight, you know, uh, I think we, we have to we help, help remove the stigma by understanding mental illness the way we understand physical. <clears throat> You know that. Um, Love that. You know, you know, and and healthy people. And when we're healthy, we can be really judgmental of those who aren't healthy, even physically. Sometimes people say, "Why does he got diabetes? And why is she sixty pounds overweight? And why doesn't a person take care of himself?" You know, those are those are judgments. No, but the same is if I'm mentally robust, see, like, why can't this guy get his life in order? And why is she depressed? And so on. Uh, see, we're, we're we're judging health. Health is a, um, it's, it's a delicate thing. So I think it, it, when we understand mental health, we'll be able to understand suicide. Then. See, this is, this is emotional cancer. This is an emotional stroke. You know, this is emotional Alzheimer's. This is the emotional, you know, diabetes. Uh, and to be able to try and look at the person holistically, yeah. you know, I think helps too. You know, it's yeah. not compartmentalize this or that about you or me. Um, and then the other, I guess, adage I always use, especially with the disability community in general, often in trying to educate people, and I think it relates here, is, you know, we say be curious, not judgmental. Because so yeah. often we are judgmental, and it's almost a habit where we're not even knowing we're doing it sometimes. Yeah. And that's not helpful. So we want to be helpful, of course, and not otherwise. Um, but, you know, Charlene, Charlene, if I can cut in on that, just to sure. mention that disability, you know, I think that's a good analogy. A lot of self sides. You're dealing with a disability. You know, except you know, with physical disabilities and you know, we and or or, or um, you know, some some learning disability, we recognize them clearly. There's other disabilities, emotional, we don't recognize them clearly, but they're a clear disability. And, and some, and, and, and we excuse me, we always say, you know, some are visible and some are invisible. Yeah, you know, and and healthy people, I'll say we we tend to be judgmental. You know. Why isn't this person healthy the way I am? You know? I know. And maybe we're not as healthy as we think we are either. Yeah. yeah. Typically, right? Um, another question here. I'm just trying to keep up here. Um, it says, we host a support group for people who have a loved one who committed suicide. A loved one who committed suicide. A number of folks that are older have lived with the belief that a person who commits suicide suicide goes straight to hell. We touched on that, I think, a little bit earlier. It has been good for them to hear about the conditions necessary to commit a sin. And that's what I think we talked a little bit about that. And the same person goes on to ask, what suggestions do you have for, uh, for starting points for parishes to begin outreach to families who have lost loved ones to suicide? I want to jump in on, on before the last question, and that is the, the whole thing. I want to say something about sin as a Catholic theologian. Or any field. First of all, you know, this is Catholic teaching. Nobody from the outside can ever say that's a sin. You can say that's wrong, objectively wrong. But sin is the way you are between you and God. Only God can make that judgment. See, so we can't even say suicide's a sin. 
you would say it's wrong, you know, uh, it's objectively wrong, see that, but I can never say that's a set, you know, see, so that, uh, not, not just about suicide, that's about everything, you know, that, that this is Catholic doctrine, you know? like, uh, you can never say it's a set, see, it's, it's an objective wrong, it's whatever, you know, but, but sin is, is a judgment, it's a conscious judgment that only you and God, uh, so that two people can do the same thing. It's a sin for one. It's not a sin for the other. You know, it depends your relation to God and so on. Okay. Now, in doing that, I forget the very last point that she made on the question. Again, uh, they were asking about starting of um, starting well, support, support. for parishes, pastoral. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I think that you know, it, probably a good way to start is is to have a group that. Um, Asks people, you know, that, that that will bring people who have lost loved ones to suicide, or other people who have um, who have a, a heartache about it, to begin and 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 to to read books about it, to talk about it, uh, and to so discuss the question openly, you know, see, so that it's like everything else. If it's under cover, it's only going to be talked about in hushed forms after it happened, you know. Uh, that's not good. We we need to have open discussions of suicide uh, but, uh, you know uh, start with a coalition of the willing start with a coalition of people who uh, you'll always get people there's a lot of wounded people out there yeah. who are looking for anything to help them cope with this sure so invite them you know, yeah. and, and i missed a question up here let me jump back up it looks like and i apologize to the person who wrote it I didn't catch it earlier. I believe they're asking, how do you help someone who has, um, looks like they have the, the idea that no one loves them, that they are abandoned? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that's, the, 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 that's the hardest question there is, you know, like, uh, mm. uh, and sadly, that's true for a lot of people, you know, like, uh, you know, it's not easy, even with a lot of, Good, healthy people. A lot of us. Sometimes it's it's hard to to uh, to accept it, to know that we're loved. You know that we don't. In fact, that's one of the toughest things. All of us. We always think we have to earn love, that we have to be good enough, we have to look good enough, we have to be good enough, we have to achieve enough, and so on. And and that's why it's so easy. As soon as something happens, that our world collapses. You know, um, and and why we we. Uh, uh, we struggle with our whole lives. Some some people are blessed and have exceptionally strong self-image and say, I'm lovable. Uh, not that easy. <laughs> I want to give you a, a, a humorous but a good graphic here. You know, a few okay. a friend of mine, she tells the story. She says her, her nephew was like three or four, you know. So the, he's a very, he's a kid who knows he's loved. So, and one time they were having a house family party, some barbecue or something. He comes with a big smile on his face and says, you know, hey, I just pooped my pants. One of you has to help me. It takes one hell of a strong self-image to do that. <laughs> you know, most of us, you know, I think you see the point. It's just we, 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 we only feel lovable when we're on top of our game, mm -hmm. when, when we're looking good, we're healthy, we're achieving, and so on. And we're pretty fragile, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and particularly with God. There's a French Canadian theologian who, who was very much challenged by this. He says, you know, no matter who you are as an adult, he said, you should pray. Go to prayer, he said, and pray this. But Jesus says, sometime, sometime in my prayer, let me hear you say you love me. He said, because before you hear that, your life, you're always insecure. You're waiting for this, you're waiting for that. So we have to hear and just know that God loves us, then we'll be secure with human love too. You know? mm -hmm. but insecurity about love is the biggest, deepest problem for 90% of us in the whole world. You know? That's why we're always having to achieve and earn love and be good enough, and look good enough. You know, because we're so scared underneath, as soon as it stops, we're gonna be alone. Well, it's scary, it's scary being vulnerable, you yeah. know. You know it's um, this is a question, a little on the darker side, exactly, but does the demon delight as he successfully haunt, taunts the lives of our loved ones? 
who struggle with ang anguish over their deep emotional sorrows within their hearts to end their suffering and not realizing the pain left behind for their families. Yeah, two questions. I'm gonna start with the demons. <laughs> okay. does, the, does the demon delight? Well, you know, I, I guess it depends how you define demons and so on. Uh, you know, the church has left that open. Uh, you can understand the demons as, you know, not personalized self beings, you know, just the problem of evil and so on. Or you, or we can understand the demons as personified that Lucifer is a person and so on. Well, if Lucifer is actually a person, no doubt he would be light in this, or maybe not, because um, he's not going to get that soul. <laughs> you know, he may be light at Hitler killing himself, but he's not going to light in some sensitive 22 year old kid, you know, who's emotionally has emotional cancer. Um, he's not going to get that soul. So that, uh, uh, you know, but the, the second part, you know, like, uh, um, you know, just that. Do they know they're hurting you that much? I don't think so, you know. Um, uh, or maybe they're just in so much pain that they don't have no other option. You know, I have a friend who I've known since high school, very good man, and his mother died by suicide when he was a kid, you know. And, and his name, he's had a lot of depression problems in his life, and he's told me two or three times, except I know what it does to the living, I would, I would kill myself. Mm -hmm. so, except he said, I don't want to ever do that. that you know, it's been on that side of it. He, he said, you know, that they said what my mom when she died, and you know, he it's not that he's in love with his mom and doesn't forgive her. It's just, you know, he said, just as a kid, he said, what that did to me. He said, I just realized I can never do it to somebody else, you know. Um, and sometimes too, like people have left letters, you know, or they'll say, Mom, I know this is gonna hurt you, and I, I know I'm bad, I, I just can't help it, you know. Uh, so that like you know, that's your clothing are on fire, so you jump out of a building. To, uh, yeah. And like you said, sometimes there's they leave something behind, not always. I guess yeah. it can vary yeah. greatly uh -huh. from individual to individual. Um, does our loving God come to a soul three times, as written in the Diary of St. Faustina, or does God give the soul many opportunities to hear his voice and accept his love and mercy at the hour of their passing? The last one, infinite number of times. You know that it, it's not certainly three times, but you no. Know, uh, in fact, even after death, you know, God will always give us a chance. You know, um, you know, we 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 can't think that there's going to be time where God says, you know, Charlene, you had your chance. You say, well, I'm sorry now. <laughs> no, uh, it, it, uh, you know, it, people who are in hell. Aren't there saying if I have 10 minutes over, I'd do an act of contrition. God would let him do it. People in hell are feeling sorry for people in heaven. They're seeing darkness as light and light as darkness, and so on. Anybody who wants to be forgiven is forgiven. You know, that's God's mercy, you know. Um, and so that God is going to give us as many chances as we need, but now there's a catch. Remember, Jesus has these stories in scripture about, you know. Come to the wedding feast, and all of a sudden it's shut. You know, you know, um, but it's not God who shuts the door. That, that's a very important spiritual and psychological warning. It's we shut the door. So, you give simple example. Imagine you have a really big fight with somebody. Okay. Uh, if you apologize the next day, you know, it might be hard. If you wait for three weeks, it's harder. If you wait for 35 years, you're never going to do it. Mm. Okay. See, after a while, we shut the door, it becomes what we call existentially impossible for us to do it, you know? See, so that uh, the longer we wait, you're like habits become our second nature. And, uh, you know, but just let me in with the story. Right, with the last you, know, you know, the famous story in scripture about the rich man and Lazarus and the rich man's in hell, you know, and, and, and he says, you know, uh, if I could go back and my brother and warn him and so on, well, Jesus looked at that story. There's a Jewish parable. Jesus stops the story in a certain way, but the Jewish parable goes on. So he said, he's in hell. And so he asked God to let him out. He said, if you give me another chance, I'll do better. So God lets him out. And then he's been, you know, dead for a while. So now he gets home. First thing, he goes to the store to buy supplies. And he buys a 
whole bunch of bread on, on his wagon. And he's coming home to escape and there's Lazarus. The farm has to get at the heat. He's learned his lesson. So Lazarus says, give me a loaf of bread. Of course, he jumped off. Absolutely. As he's reaching for it, he thought, he doesn't need a whole loaf of bread. He said, I know. He said, what? He wouldn't really eat something. I could give him some dry bread. Ten minutes later, he's back in hell. You know, see, it's, it's uh, I think you get the moral of that story. See, God doesn't shut the gates of heaven. We shut them. You know, so God is going to give us many chances, but Jesus says, if you don't take them, every time you miss a chance, it's going to be harder to take the next one, take the next one. Like we know that with human reconciliation, the longer we drift apart, the more the gulf develops for after all, so we're never going to be reconciled. Very true. Well, amen to that, Father. Um, so grateful for your time tonight. I told you we wouldn't keep you more than the one hour. So um, I, the conversation has been been rich and, and wonderful. And again, we are honored to have had you with us tonight. I appreciate it so much. Um, for people listening, just to let you know, we um, from NCPD, the National Catholic Partnership on Disability, we usually caption all of our videos. So we will, since we didn't have a live caption tonight, we will certainly have that um, done post-production. And then when it's posted on our website, the captions will be available as well. We want everything to be as accessible to as many people as would like to get the information. Um, and the only other thing I would like to say to our listeners, of course, is that we have two more webinars in this series, November 9th and December 14th. So on our website, ncpd.org, if you haven't already registered, you may wish to do so. We've got Responding to Suicide with uh, Deacon Ed Schoner and Bishop John Dolan, Auxiliary Bishop of San Diego, uh, next month. And December 14th is talking about youth suicide. We touched on that a little tonight, just the name of it, but um, Chris Miller, the chair of our Council on Mental Illness and a, a representative from the National Federation of Catholic Youth Ministry will speak, will address that. And um, just letting you know, I'm seeing a lot of little thank yous coming in on the on the chat. And with that, Father, if you don't mind taking us out, at least with a blessing tonight, we'd be delighted. Okay, thanks, Shirley. So we ask for God's blessing. Lord, we ask you to bless us, still our hearts, Clean our hearts of confusion, fill our hearts of all bitterness, fill our hearts of anger. And give us a deep understanding of your mercy. Give us a deep understanding of our, each other's weaknesses. We ask for this through Jesus, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Charlene. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks. Thank you.